Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Karen Slaborski. I am the president of CLAMA, and you'll hear more from me at the end because we have a time crunch this morning. So I'm going to just introduce you to uh, our speaker here, Bill Kirkpatrick, because um, all of you are here to learn about hydrilla, um, which is a serious threat to the lake, but he's going to tell us all about it. He has been our applicator for, I think, since the beginning and does a great job and has kept us up with everything we need to know. So without further ado, I'll announce Bill Kirkpatrick from Aquatic Environmental Consultants. Yep, thank you. So I wish I wasn't talking about hydrilla today, but we are. Um, I've been working with Dr. Santora since the onset of this. I guess PADCNR, Russ Maurer, used to treat your lake, and the state used to buy some products for you to treat your lake, and, and they kind of cut that off. And so my transition was I came here and worked with Russ Maurer the last year he did the application, and then we started working directly with you. And it's, it's, it's been a really good program. It's worked really well. But in, in all the years prior to August of last year, we were mainly addressing Eurasian water milfoil and some, some other plants and some other areas. But uh, I spoke here a few years ago and I talked about water chestnut. And I brought water chestnut in from another site and showed you what that plant looked like because it was just south of here. And it, until that point, it was, it, was, it was in Mercer County at one location. Until then, it was always on the East Coast. It was never out here. And so we talked about that to be aware for that plant to look. Hydrilla has been around the area. It's a pima tuning. It's very bad in the PADC and our state lakes. Um, Lake Arthur is full of it. It is, has not yet been found in Prescott Bay. It's not yet been identified in Edinburgh Lake, but those are real threats. Prescott Bay, a very big threat because it's got a lot of habitat. So when you look at an invasive plant, you're looking at where can it grow? What grows in, in you know, water that's a few inches deep out to maybe 12, 15 feet deep. So if you have a 100 acre lake with a max depth of 15 feet, it can fill in the whole lake, the entire lake, okay? You have a deep lake, so your lake is kind of the shoreline areas that are a threat to hydrilla. But my purpose in the talk today is twofold. To help you understand what hydrilla looks like and understand the threat of this plant to your lake so that you personalize this because I can only do so much. I need all of your help and all of the other lake users at Conneaut Lakes help to work as a team to manage this problem. And if we can do that, we can manage it for a, a much more affordable cost than we can if you, if you don't help. So you're not getting paid to help but you indirectly are because of some things I'm going to discuss here. So, the project, Conneaut Lake, Crawford County, you all know that. Um, about a 938 basically natural lake. I don't quite know the discussions of the outlet here. The water level might have changed a couple of feet, but not much, right? You know, it's basically where it's supposed to be. Uh, it's a major recreational area. I mean, if, last night we were down here, I mean, the, the economic value of Conneaut Lake to this region cannot be, you know, taken for granted. You have to understand this is why people are here. If the lake wasn't here, the little town here would probably be a one-stop intersection, right? So, the problem, early stage monaceous hydrilla infestation at the north end of the lake. We were told about this in August of 2020. The person that found that, would they be in this room or not? Do you know who that was, up, Brian? Actually showed up on iNaturalist. It what? It showed up on iNaturalist. So somebody took a picture and sent it in. Yeah. You saw it, came out and checked it, but you don't know who the person was. I can't remember what their name was. Okay. Yeah. Somebody found it, took a picture of it, and sent it in. Brian came and looked. We got a phone call from my thing, or an email for a phone call I was on. In the early morning, Dr. Santora called me in the afternoon. We were here the next day treating it, okay? There's a couple different ways to treat it, and I'm going to talk about that as we get into it. But we had a major rapid response because it's critical to stop the spread. Because when you can control it in an isolated area, it's much more affordable than it gets out to a, to a much broader area. So it's a major threat to the ecological health of the lake and the economical value to the region. 
This has been documented time and time again with uh, hydro infestations throughout the country. So here's Conneaut Lake. This is a map that we submitted to get our permit to treat the lake. So all of these, all of these yellow areas around the lake are kind of treatment zones. Um, areas like this cove here are not on the treatment zone, but they are very good region for hydrilla to, infect, to become infested. Same way with some of these areas around here, um, but they're not, they're not in our treatment map because there's not houses there. But you have to be aware that most of the entire shoreline of the lake can be come infested with hydrilla. And so we want to prevent that. We want to stop that because hydrilla grows not like a native plant, it's an invasive plant. And I'll tell you a little bit about, about how it grows. So the, the area of the lake that the hydrilla was found is up here at the north end near the Fish and Boat Commission launch. There's your vector, possibly. Okay, um, boat comes in here, the stuff blows off and then blows into the shoreline here and anchors. So they come from Pymatuna, they come from Lake Arthur, the plants are hanging on their boat trailer, hanging on their prop, they get into that area. So it's not uncommon that it's very close to a public access, but um, that's where it was found. So the area that it was found in is basically this area back in here, back in this cove. And so what we did this year, we're treating this whole block. So when we came last year in August, because we had a rapid response, we had to use what's called a contact herbicide. Meaning we come in, we put it on, it kills the plant within days. Stuff's dead. Um, but it's not the preferred method of control. So we looked at, looked at various options, uh, but that was our rapid response. And so we set up this treatment zone at the north end as our target area because the plant was found in this cove, right, Brian, and then a little patch over here. Yep. From what I understand. So Joe came and treated it last year. I wasn't able to do it. Joe came up and, and he did that. So here's the plant. When you find it, it's not going to look like this. But this is a really good picture that shows you what you're looking for. The key to look are these little serrations on the edge of the leaves. This is the key, okay? Doesn't always have that, but it mostly will. So lock that picture in your mind. These are very confusing. The one on the left is hydrilla, invasive. The one on the right is Elodea, the native. Your lake has a lot, a lot of Elodea, okay? The difference is, hydrilla will usually have five whorls. Hydrilla will, or Elodea will normally have three. So hydrilla five, Elodea three. Not 100% of the time, okay? Hydrilla will usually have serrated leaves. Elodea will never have serrated leaves. So if you see serrations on a leaf margin on a plant with whorls around the stem that kind of looks like this, that's what you're looking for. So that is, that is hydrilla. This, you can Google it off the internet, okay? Um, hydrilla does have these small little spines on the bottom of the leaf. I never looked for that. I, I just, I don't think it's that common that says that, that Elodea doesn't. But the two keys are the five whorls and the serrated leaves on the thing. And then I'm going to show you something else for another positive ID. So we, went, we looked at this picture. That's hydrilla, okay? But if you find it, that's what it's going to look like. Can you see the similarities, but see how it's, it's, it's a little harder to identify? If you can see here, there's little tiny serrations. <coughs> the whorls, it's a little thicker. It's a little heavier than what Elodea. Elodea is going to be a little bit lighter um, when you see it. But that is probably a good example of a plant. If you pick it up, that's what hydrilla is going to look like. Any questions on that? Are those pinchy or not? <coughs> uh, it's a flexible leaf. The little spines, I don't, I don't think you'll really feel them. You, you might a little bit. You could get a little <laughs> calcification on there that'll make it kind of, kind of crusty. But uh, that's kind of what, I, I, I thought that was a really good example of what the plant's gonna look like. So, is, is the Elodea bad also? Uh, Elodea is a native plant. It's very easily controlled. It doesn't grow with the rapidness and the density of the invasive plant. 
So the problem with hydrilla is, is how it takes over. It takes over and creates this huge biomass that is so thick. And that's kind of what I want to discuss with this slide. Um, the impacts from hydrilla, because it grows so heavy, so thick, so dense, it can grow in deeper water than a lot of the natives because it can use reduced sunlight. It displaces the native vegetation. Native vegetation is very good for the biology of the lake, the biota of the lake, fish communities, all that. Native plants are, but native plants, if you look at how they grow, they grow in pods, they have spaces between them, fish can get in and they can feed. Hydrilla is so thick that it actually can reduce the weight of sport fish because the prey can hide in there. The sport fish can't feed because there's not these openings. They can't lay in a little opening in the bed. So fishermen like hydrilla because it forms this hard edge. So as it grows out from shoreline, you have this hard edge of where it stops growing because the water gets too late and all the bass lay on that edge because that's their only opportunity to feed. They can't feed back in the hydrilla because it's too thick. They feed on that edge so the fishermen stand on the edge, they cast up and they fish down that edge and all the bass are there and they have great fishings. Whereas in a native plant community, the bass are dispersed in the vegetation and they feed inside so you got to fish more pockets. So Fishermen tend to think hydrilla is a good thing. It's not. It's not healthy for the fishery. It's not healthy for the water uses. It obstructs boating, swimming, fishing. You know, nobody's having fun anymore. Everybody's complaining about weeds. Property values, documented. Significant impact on property values. Nobody wants to go to a lake that's overtaken with hydrilla. And then that leads to tourists coming to town, bringing your money to the restaurant, bringing your money to hotels coming in the traffic, all those things get impacted by hydrilla. It's well documented. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a biological threat to your lake. It's an economic threat to all of you. So be aware, do something about it, okay? So hydrilla was identified in August of 2020. We looked at some management goals. Um, the management goal is we want to contain this 100%. We don't want it to break out. We don't want it to get away, okay? It's a, it's a big lake. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to do that. You gotta look around and find out where all it's growing, okay? Tuber bank, and I'm gonna talk about tubers a little bit. So hydrilla is different from Elodea that it produces tubers. And these tubers are like potatoes. A potato is a tuber. So you go to a restaurant and order a potato, that's a tuber. Hydrilla produces these little tubers in the soil, and these tubers over season or over winter, so when they get mature, they make a tuber and that tuber is dormant in the soil. We cannot kill that tuber. That tuber needs to sprout and start to grow before we can kill the tuber. So we want to kill the tuber before, or we want to kill the hydrilla before it makes tubers. That was the plan last August. Hey, we found it. Next day, 24 hours, boom, we're here. We kill the plant. The plants are, are mostly dead and gone. I think it has some remnants in that area, but we, we got a a big bang. Um, so did they produce tubers? Maybe, maybe not, but hopefully we reduced the rate of tuber production that they had. Um, and then those tubers can stay in the soil, they stay up for seven years. So they don't only sprout the next year. So when we find it in an area, we typically come back and retreat that same area for five, seven, nine years, something like that, to make sure that we're not getting any remnants sprouting out of that area. We don't want any new tuber formation, so we want to kill any hydrilla before it gets mature and out of hand. So if hydrilla is found in the next month, we need to get here, we need to hit those areas with contact herbicides and then <coughs> add them to the management program, which I'm going to discuss next. So after some technical exchange with various parties, based on our history and our experience um, with managing hydrilla, we decided to use a product made by the Seapro company called sonar pellets. And there's a variety of different sonar pellets. And the idea is sonar is available in different forms and you target that plant with a dosage rate over a long period of time. So like taking your antibiotics. You don't just take one antibiotic or take the whole bottle to start. You take the antibiotic over a period of 14 days or whatever to keep that in your system. With the sonar, we want to expose the hydrilla plant to the fluoridone at a low dose. Fluoridone is the active ingredient in the sonar, but, we, but it dilutes out of the area. So we use a pellet that releases 
that like a slow release off that pellet and keeps that dose in that area for an extended period of time over 60 to 90 days and what that does is it interferes with the metabolism in the plant. It's not a contact herbicide, it gets into the plant, it's a systemic herbicide and it interferes with the plant's ability to produce chlorophyll. So it starves the plant, it slows it down and it starves it, it prevents it from making tubers and it kills it. So you killed it, it's gone, it didn't produce tubers so you don't have the risk of a new tuber forming the next year. The only way hydrilla forms tubers is if no one finds it and no one kills it. So that's your job. Find it, we'll come kill it. Okay? And if we kill it in small areas, it's a lot more affordable. So can you pull it out? I mean, okay, don't want to pull it out. Don't want to pull it out unless you dig it out. And I'm gonna, we're going to get in here a little bit more for that. So this was our program this year. Come on, time. So this was a program this year. We did the first treatment, June 1st. That's around the time the hydrilla starts to sprout because we want to get it when it's young, successful, or susceptible. It's weak, it starts to grow. So we did the first application of pellets, June 1st. A little over three weeks later, we did it three and a half weeks later, we did the second application. And then about three and a half weeks later, we did the, the third application yesterday. So we've got our 30, 60, 90 days of contact in that area and um, that was our treatment. The next part is the monitoring. Critical. I have important, I should have had is critical. That's really the word that I need to be using there because it is critical. You use the lake. Look. Talk to Brian. Brian is a key point in the area that he can, he's close, he can come over, he can take a look at it or send somebody over, grab a sample, look at it and see what it is. The harvester is a little bit of a concern because it cuts plants. So we're trying to work with John and the harvesting operation and making sure that they're aware of what they're looking for and it doesn't get cut because cutting can spread it. It can cut, sprout a root, regrow in another area. Okay? It's not COVID, but it's, <laughs> it's hydrilla. <laughs> okay. So our results have been positive. We were here yesterday. We treated we did not see the hydrilla in the area where we're treating, and then we went basically from the boat launch the whole area of the lighthouse at that end. We had some sun out, we could see, we looked, we pulled up some plants, did not find any hydrilla. That's good. Doesn't mean it's not here somewhere, but we didn't find it. So results have been very positive. So this is kind of what an early stage growth of hydrilla looks like. This is an underwater photograph of an area at Deep Creek Lake in, in Western Maryland. We've been working with Deep Creek Lake about nine years now. It's a 3,000 acre impoundment. They found hydrilla there. We started treating it the next year. Okay, so it's what, three times the size of yours, a little three and a half times the size of yours. They found it in different areas. We started treating about 90 acres. Then we went up to about 107 acres. They're spending $150,000 a year treating this plant. Now this is the state of Maryland, and the governor happens to be from Western Maryland. A lot of people from Eastern Maryland travel to Western Maryland and Deep Creek Lake, so economic value there. Politicians are aware. The state has a park on the lake, and we work with the park. So there was state money involved, and they started to address this. We attacked this. We've reduced, we've reduced that program down to we're at about 62 acres that we treat. Um, uh, two years ago, they found one plant in a 2,000 acre lake. But they're being aggressive, they're monitoring, we're aggressively attacking it, and they prevented it from getting out and spreading through the whole lake. Because if it spreads to the 3,000 acres, then you're talking money that probably can't be done. So your risk here is spend several thousand dollars now, monitor, watch, look for it. So you don't spend hundreds of thousands of dollars later. That's really, that's really the bottom line. So this is, this is, you know, it's sprouting out of the soil. It's kind of what it looks like. This is a really important slide because this shows not in great detail, but this shows our three plants. So this is your native Elodea over here. Remember that from the early slide. This is your hydrilla here. Okay. It's much more vigor if you look at it. The Elodea does not have tubers on the bottom. These are the little tubers that I'm talking about. So somebody's thinking, can you, can, you, can you cut it up or tear it? 
you cut this, that tuber's still, still, still growing. So you really got to get this tuber out of the ground or you got to get chemical down into the tuber. That's really the key. You kill the plant, tuber dies. Um, John showed us yesterday on the harvester. He brought this plant over to us here. Coontail's in your leg. He said, is this LED? I said, no, that's coontail. So coontail and LED, you have lots of this in your lake. It looks similar to this, but doesn't have the, coontail has a finer leaf, leaflet on it, a little narrow leaflet, and the hydrilla has a little broader leaf with those serrated edges. If it has these, 100% confirmation of hydrilla. So if you go down, here's, the, here's where the soil would be. You dig down, you dig for this, and you just, just go down in, you know, six inches, and you dig, and you kind of rinse the mud off, you'll see these tubers. That's the key. That's 100% identification of high knowledge. Okay? So, this is the one plant from Deep Creek Lake, BC4. I put this picture in here. This was the one plant that they found in 2021. The only plant they found in areas. This is what it looks like under impact from the sonar, the Florida. See how it bleaches out? The tip's still green. It's trying to grow. That plant's dead. That plant's dead. It just doesn't know it yet. It, take, it, it inhibits the plant's ability to make photosynthesis and bleaches that plant out. And that's what it looks like. So if you're in the treatment area, hydrilla will start to bleach where the Elodea won't, because Elodea is not as susceptible to the, to the treatment. So we can win with this treatment, and the hydrilla is very susceptible to it, where the native plants can kind of survive it, and it doesn't impact that as much. So it's a real good tool as far as management to kind of address and the hydrilla kind of turn pink and be like, oh, there's hydrilla. So, questions? Yes? Um, the treatments, is it any harmful to people or animals? Nope. Nope. There are some limited irrigation restrictions on it because we're putting an herbicide in the water, but the reality of it is where we're treating now, where you are, we treat lakes with, with this and they still irrigate. So it's, it all depends on those great. So there's no restriction on swimming, fishing, or boating. So from all of our treatments, the treatment we do early in the year with the contact herbicides for the mofo and stuff, there's no restriction on swimming, fishing, or boating. Okay? Where did it originate from? The hydrilla? Yes. Um, the hydrilla came from, I don't know, what country, Brian? They're thinking around Korea, somewhere in that. Yeah, somewhere around Korea, Sri Lanka, I heard, something like that. Um, Eurasian Mofo was kind of imported for the aquarium industry. Hydrilla, I think, may have been. So what happens these these aquarium industries, they need plants that survive in your fish tank. The native plants won't survive in your fish tank, so they go get exotics, and they start selling it. it starts, that's how a lot of them spread. They get brought in here, sometimes from the government. On the floor rows, things like that. <laughs> yeah. So why doesn't the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania do what the state of Maryland does? Probably because your governor's not from Connie Otley. I don't want to get into I'm being recorded. I'm being recorded. I don't want to. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna punt on that one. Okay. <laughs> That's why I'm asking the question. Maybe yep. loaded, but it. Yeah. It's, this thing is all politics. It is, and it would be good if uh, you had a state representative that lived on the lake. That would be a good thing. So that's something for Clama to, to work on. I know um, many places where you change lakes, they inspect the Yeah. We have kayaked in that little inside. Yep. It's a great place to take pictures of Aaron. And, yep. Um, should there be some publicity about not going in there? No, I don't think you can. So, so to, to transport this, it's not like it's not like it's going to be on your stuff and you not see it. Not it, like zebra mussels. Not like zebra mussels. It's not getting into a boat intake or something. It's going to be a piece of plant. So a kayak's very easy to clean. You can look at it. You can see there's vegetation. The problem is a boat trailer that backs in a pond tuning in the morning or Lake Arthur in the morning. Fishing stinks. Let's go to Conneaut. They back their trailer in. They load their boat. They drive. 45 minutes an hour up here, back their boat in, it washes off, now you got it. And and there's inspection signs, people put at boat ramps, but people need to be educated about doing it. So you have a couple boat ramps. I will say this, we found it in a lake um, in South, summer, near Somerset, Pennsylvania, this past year. It's like we've worked on it for 30 years, kind of like we've been here. Never had hydrilla. 
they drew their lake down the summer before the not this past winter but the winter before so you had a big drawdown in the lake okay they fill the lake back up we're out there in uh, um in july of last year and we find hydrilla growing in two separate areas of an arm of this uh, lake the size of kind two separate arms of the lake it's growing in these two separate areas totally away from the boat ramp totally away from the boat ramp and it's like how does it get in these two separate places and the only thing i can come up with both of the areas where we find it found it had islands and the geese would nest on the islands and they have a lot of geese did the geese see some tubers drag them in not digest them i don't know if that's possible mill or not but you know stranger things have happened but but could that be the vector so it's not just boat traffic boats boats tra and boat trailers are big vectors but you know there are other ones um so yeah it, you, you need to, to look at your stuff and clean it. when you leave when you come pick the weeds off we, we our, our boats get around constantly paramount to clean so we're going home today our boat was on here yesterday we clorox bleached the whole thing so this afternoon i got to go home and and bleach all my equipment and let us sit till monday because with zebra muscle can come out like that. so we're just very aware of where we are in transforming the basic species yes when you identify them and treat them are you also trying to dig up the tubulars or not no we're not because then you miss them we don't we need those tubers actively growing to take the, up the herbicide so digging is not really a control method because you don't know what you don't have you miss so it's better to let those plants grow into the treatment area and kill them grow grow into the treatment and kill them our hope is that area that we killed it last year before it really got a chance to lay down tubers so it's looking very good up there now so. and if you go up to that area you're paddling up in your kayak some of the spatter dock the water lily plants you'll see those bleaching white it's not killing them it's stressing them but uh, it's, it's showing the same response of the Jordan <coughs> that the hydrolysis is going to show. So you kind of see the area where we treat it. Sure. Could we search the lake with underwater cameras? You can't, I mean, you can do that kind of stuff. The best method, and I've talked with Brian about this, Brian's kind of in charge of that, is, is late season, late August into September, those beds will be vigorous, is on a nice sunny calm day when the sun's shining not a lot of clouds you can see down you can spot this stuff and we know we know what we're looking for that you can see if you see a bed of vegetation that looks out of place and really really thick you need to go investigate that's exactly what we did last year when when the report finally came is that first thing we did was contact Klamath so that they could contact bill and then the second thing we did was we went out with Fish and Boat Commission and we went around the lake and did exactly what he said, looking for vegetation that was that looked unusual, knew what we were looking for, and that was the only spot we found We we got lucky we got lucky last year because a kayaker went up there and took a picture. Because yeah. we never know what. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. are, are you actively treating the whole perimeter of the lake, like on that yellow areas? Of we're we're not actively treating all those areas. We treat that's something to discuss with climate we treat spots around there but we need to apply for a permit and the permit process is complicated um, if you go over 80 acres of permitted area you need a different kind of permit it becomes much more cumbersome so we generated that map and stayed just under the 80 acres and that allows us to to manage those areas and so we're able to do that with a regular general 9138 permit rather than an MPS. I have a question. If, for instance, we had cameras that could help in the fall, is it too late to treat them? No, we would still, we would, depending on when we found them, we would probably still come try to treat it. But we would come treat it and identify, we treat it with a contact herbicide, we'd identify that area, and then next spring, June 1st, we would start to do the, the other the Florida treatment. No, this a uh, cold winter, like a freezing. Not really. The tubers will too. That, that lake that was drawn down was drawn down in the winter, and the next year they had hydrilla in a the lake they never had hydrilla. So, you know, why, why a drawdown all winter? You fill the lake back up, and now all of a sudden you got hydrilla in a lake that never had it. I'm talking heavy beds of hydrilla. And it's like, where was it? How did it get there? What 
just is is really worth it. Really worth it. So who's paying for the treatment now? What's that? Who's paying for the treatment? Who's paying for the treatment? Is that your segue? <laughs> 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 huh? We know. Huh? You want to take it? Sure. very well to my thank you very much to everybody this year. Um, we had the letter that went out in the spring, which was a call to action, and people responded. Um, it's been the best fundraising year we've had at this point in time so far. We've had numbers of people who've never donated before come out and start supporting Clama, so we've had a lot of good response. And of course, many of you in the room always support Clama, and we super appreciate that. So we have a very good base of donors that support us all the time. Um, it is not treated by the state because the state treatment for Pennsylvania falls under the state park system and we don't have any state park lake, state park land on Conyet Lake. So we do our best to find money in other ways. We apply for grants and things for equipment and get help that way. The conservation district is very instrumental over the years in getting several grants. They got our first harvester through a grant and they do projects for prevention and care of the lake in other ways. So we do our best to utilize all those resources. Um, but our primary source of funding is personal donations from you guys. Um, our events, our Clema Bash in the spring, um, coming up on August 25th, I believe, we have the Groove coming for our dance party, and Crawford Gives, August 27th through 29th, is also another source where people can give through that program, and there's some matching funds soon to that program that can be added in for that. So that is how we are funded. Um, let's see. All out of order from what I was planning, so. <laughs> Covered all that, so yes. Because we were prepared, um, like Bill said, he was here the next day when we found that. But that's all due to all the donations that you guys give and the preparation and the board decision to try to figure out how to be proactive. So we need to be, what I got from your talk was monitoring, monitoring, and everybody needs to really so, take it personal and take ownership that this is your lake, this is our lake, and we're the ones responsible for taking care of it. And we need to go out and try to monitor the best we can. Karen? Yes. Everyone that's here and anyone we contact, talk to your neighbors about how the money comes. Because you hear a lot of stories. People will say to me, well, the state would treat the lake if we weren't doing it. No. no that's not true. But, but there are a lot of people in the area who think that, and they do not donate because of that. So I try to explain to them what's really going on. But everybody here, if we all tell five people and they tell five people, maybe the donations go up, people understand what's really going on. Thank you very much. That actually leads into a little bit of some of what we're working on and what we are in need of. Um, marketing, as you said, some people don't know. There are still, it blows my mind, people that have never heard of Clama. So we need to, we are working on our marketing efforts, but we have a board of very few people. Um, we have Bob and Bobby Santora, Milt Ostrowski, Ryan Polarczyk, Lynn Sandison, uh, Doug Peters, Judy Stiborski, and myself, Karen Stiborski. That's the board. So we need manpower help. And one thing I'm specifically looking for at the moment is someone who can help lead a marketing program and develop our website. We have a website, but it certainly could use some further attention. So. If you know somebody who has a marketing company, could help us out, and advise us and help us go along that path, that's one specific area that we could use a volunteer right now. And that would be a project that they could do and then not be committed for life. <laughs> um, in, a, in addition to that, we are also working out what the future of Clama is. Um, you know, our volunteer model has lasted since 1996, but we need additional manpower and we are in the process of visioning what that's going to look like and where that help is going to come from and how to make it sustainable in perpetuity. So, I mean, the lake is a living, breathing ecosystem. We can't apply it herbicide once and fix it. There is no one-time fix. It's like your lawn, like your flower bed. We are maintaining this forever. So that maintenance is how that's going to be addressed. We've done a 
bang up job so far in the last what, 20 some years. So we need to continue that and see how that's going to go. If you're anybody that has any help, any interest in strategic planning or has an interest in seeing that happen, we welcome input and and help from that as well. Were you going to say something? I was just going to say, <laughs> it's, it's the whole financial thing. It's going to cost you less to do the work now than it is if you don't. If you don't do the work now, then it gets expensive. And, Absolutely. And, and <laughs> yeah, volunteer, talk to people. It's cheaper to get people to give a couple hundred bucks and more of you. It, it, I mean, you have a lake here. You're experiencing You're out there in your boat. Um, if this was an HOA where everybody paid dues to the lake, it would be very expensive for you to, to do that. And, and, and the HOA would say, we're going to charge $50 a boat to have a sticker on your boat to use the lake. And, and, and that, then you generate your revenue. You, you don't have that leverage and you don't have the support of the local government. So it, it falls on everybody that lives there. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, that's a great guideline. If you put $100 per watercraft that you have on the lake and people donate in that nature, that would make a huge difference. That's one gauge of how to do that. So much per lakefront property, so much per other property, because your home values are directly tied to, the, it's to that tied lake. your wallet. <laughs> right. So uh, another thing is that the cheapest way to deal with invasive species is prevention. Bill kind of alluded to it a little bit, but cleaning your gear, cleaning your boats as you're moving them in and out. Um, if you notice, if you've gone to Pima Tuning, there's, uh, there's people there that actually check the boats as they come in. So they have launch stewards that are checking to make sure they're not taking anything in or taking anything out. Uh, they also have invasive species disposal stations. So those are things that you can look at here. Pima Tuning actually loaned Coyote Lake, their launch stewards, a couple of times just to kind of get that that thought out there that that's that's something that can be done, but um, you know those are ways that you can prevent uh, invasive species from coming in, and especially the cleaning. Uh, that's the way that you're going to catch stuff. Cleaning those plants off. I can't tell you how many times I go to the launches and all the trailers are loaded with plants, completely loaded with plants, and I don't know how many of them actually pull those plants off of those trailers. We need to make sure that that's happening so that we're not bringing stuff in and we're not taking stuff from Conneaut Lake. Sky Lake has some nasty stuff that we don't want in other lakes too. It has kabamba, it has zebra mussels, it has things that we don't want to take elsewhere. So that prevention is the cheapest, absolutely cheapest way, because all it costs you is time. It doesn't cost you, it doesn't cost you money. Brian, one yeah. point on loaning that people come over, they've never been here on a weekend. You can get them out here on a Saturday or Sunday, the launches are a lot busier than they are during you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Just a word of advice that might help too. Yeah, they spread them out all around the region, so and that's usually during a, a specific time period. So it's it's hard to get them all out. Yeah, on like a specific said, like day. A, a one or two weekends, you know, mm -hmm. Saturday, Sunday. Because I, I've talked to them over there when you were you know, harvesting and stuff, and uh, yeah, they're great. They're doing a great job, yeah. but it's a lot of that downtime versus a weekend where we boat after boat after boat. So as is with anything, prevention is the key. So prevention and awareness and looking for it because we all need to take our personal responsibility for taking care of the lake. Um, Bill, with the prevention... You, excuse me. Bill, you mentioned washing your boat down with Clorox. If, well, if, if, somebody right. come, if somebody comes in to launch their boat and it's a mess, <clears throat> will the car wash work? Well, the car wash will. So here's, here's the difference with our boat is. We have spray equipment on our boat. We're pumping water into our system. So typically on a boat, drain and dry. So you pull your plug, dry your boat. That's typically enough. Your bilge pump on your motor, we have a little boot, we hook to a garden hose, start the motor, run a little bit of water through, that's clean. We Clorox our spray tanks, recirculate, get that in there. So I'm not implying to Clorox your boats. <laughs> clean, drain, and dry. Yeah, but and what, what I'm getting at is if that guy's in the parking lot and say, hey, there's a car wash right up the street. Yeah. Go you, clean your boat off. Before you you could it. clean the boat, get the weeds off, wash it off. The, the big thing with the zebra mussels is your boat's parked on the lake, the zebra mussels attached to your boat, start to grow, now you move it to another lake and they come off. Those things really need to be cleaned well. For a boat that's coming and going and it's, it's on a trailer all its life except when it's fishing, 
Zebra mussels, the only real way is if you got them in your live well mm -hmm. or in your village pump on your motor. So drain your live well, drain your boat, dry it, and then pump your village on your boat. And that pretty much gives, because zebra mussels, there's little, what's it called? Mill villagers. 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 They get sucked in, you can't see them, and they hang out, hang out in there. And, they, and then you pump them somewhere else. So. Still, I've been asked a lot of times, the weed treatment does nothing for the zebra mussels. So. No. Okay. A lot of times, once uh, once some, like zebra mussels, once they're here, they're here. We're not we're not, not getting back up. <laughs> Our driller got a chance at because we caught right. early. But uh, zebra mussels, once they're here, they're here. And I, what we found yesterday, that Bill looked at when we closer examination, they were smaller zebra mussels, which means they're still reproducing in this lake. They, they seem to have a cycle. With my son-in-law doing the docks, he. Uh, He'll say, "Well, they weren't too bad this year. You know, we didn't have to wear gloves, and they weren't kind of right." Then the next time, it's, "Yeah, we're wearing industrial gloves now because there's so many zebra mussels." So I want to acknowledge while we're here, we have our uh, past operations manager for the harvester, Jim Hunt, with us here today, and our current operations manager, Don Tracy. So they have done a bang-up job through the years, running all the equipment and keeping us in business. So thank you. Very much. couldn't be done without you all. And um, in the note of safety, I also do want to point out that prevention is key for Plama, for safety, and if you're looking for safety on the lake, I want you to consider as well supporting Plama and your local fire department and ambulance service, because prevention and in advance is the time to support them so that they're there when you need them. Um, and one other personal thing is if you're on a kayak or a paddleboard, please wear bright colors because the boats moving fast can't see you if you're wearing white or gray or blue. So wear bright colors so you can be seen so we can prevent future accidents because we certainly don't want to have any of those. Um, the last notes I'll speak about is the, the money portion again. Um, so the additional amount for the treatments for the hydrilla or an estimate of an additional 30000 per year above our normal budget for the next how not, however many years. We don't know that for sure. And that's the high estimate. So hopefully, since we're catching it early, that can come in well underneath that. But just to give you an idea of the fundraising needs, um, our present harvester is 11 years old. Um, when we got it, it cost $115,000. And an estimate to replace that is now $375,000. So as we've been very proactive and very conservative with the finances, you can see that in the future, things just cost more. All that lovely inflation that we're facing through everything, and that's you know more than three times the cost of the original harvester. So we, because we've had such great care and great people taking care of it, it's in really great shape, but we are planning for the future and, and trying to keep that in mind as we operate every day. So if nobody has any more questions. I have one have more statement. Uh, you know, Clamma does all of this. People should spread the word. Without Clamma, in two years, you'd be able to walk across the north end of the lake. That's how fast you should grow in. So if we don't, if nobody else wants to do it, we do it. And that's why we need the help, we need the funding, we need the support. There are a lot of people on the lake that don't understand that. I wonder if we shouldn't go to the government uh, local government and ask them to try to put a tax on the people that own the property along the lake because without the lake, the property along the lake is going to be worthless. The problem with that is, have you ever seen Summit Township, Sadbury Township, and the borough agree on anything together? Yeah. It doesn't happen. Yeah. And yes, thank you. That's exactly the kind of thing we are working on into the future because, as, as we said, the Board of Volunteers is not able to do that, so we need the cooperation of all the municipalities, the DEP, the Fish and Boat Commission, everybody around the area, because it's such a resource to everybody. Sir. Uh, this isn't directly related, but I think it's important to mention. Uh, it's, it's a known and published fact that the Federal Wildlife and Fish Commission is attempting to take over some or all of the uh, French Creek watershed and make it part of the Erie Wildlife Refuge, okay? And my question is, are you aware of that at Klamath? And are you, if so, are you concerned that that may, in the future, prohibit treatment of the lake? Um, I will say that I was not personally aware of that. Mm -hmm. I, I know that we have the conservancy so that is directly... So what was the wildlife area? 
It's a Erie Wildlife Refuge. Yes. We've treated it in a Erie Wildlife Refuge area. So I think they would probably be open to that. Okay. We've but, been up there and busted off some habitat because they've had their their waterfowl ponds have been monocultures. And so we've gone up there and broken up and opened those things up. So I don't think they would be opposed to treating. I don't think so. That's something we're going to look into, so thank you very much for bringing that up. But the, the Clamble was, or Conservancy was, was based on Client Lake, so there's a lot of interest in keeping that communication open. So we yeah. Just to just that. point out, in the uh, French Creek uh, uh, watershed, it includes Conneaut Lake, Edinburgh Lake, and all the way up to Finley Lake. You know, so there's a big area here that's talking about somewhat taking control of, you know. Well. <laughs> Which isn't good news to me. Do we have any other questions? Well, again, I just want to thank you all for coming out, for taking the time to care and learn a little bit more. I learned a ton this morning, and thank you all. You have supported Clama greatly through the years, and we just really appreciate it. So thank you. I did want to say there's some talk cards. to your Oh, yeah. thank you. There are cards, informational cards mm -hmm. in the back, so there's nice little cards that you can take and stick on your boat so that you can pull it out when you need that reference point. And um, if you happen to have any cash or check, we do have tickets available for the dance. <coughs> and I do have one more thing to add. Uh, as Bill has mentioned, everybody's been talking about trying to, uh, to help watch the lake. And we do need the folks that are out on the lake. There's 900 acres out there. So even if we do pull a survey together every year, that's a lot of area that we're trying to survey and trying to, trying to watch. You're there every day uh, out on the lake multiple times a week, uh, you know, out there and looking. If you find something that you think is hydrilla, the best thing for you to do is take a close-up picture of it, get a nice close-up picture of a single plant. A lot of times what I'll do is have a white background. It can be a piece of uh, eight and a half by 11 white paper. I used to use a white frisbee all the time. You can use a white tray, put a little water in it, put the, the piece of plant in it, take a close-up picture, send that picture. You can either send it to me directly or if you know Doug or Karen or someone else on the board a little bit better, send it to them and take a look at it. The second thing is note exactly where you found it. Uh, because it doesn't do me any good if you say it. <laughs> yes. It's up by the Jones That's house. true. <laughs> yeah, we forgot to mention that. That's, yeah. That is important. <laughs> yeah. because I have had Remember where you got it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly where you got it. Um, because yeah. if, if I get, it's halfway between the Jones house and the Smith house. Uh, I'll never find it. Um, so, so yeah, take a very good close-up picture of it. A lot of times if you have a white background and a little bit of water in it, it really shows up well. And that'll tell me whether or not you have hydrilla or not and tells me whether or not I need to go out and take a look and see how much you do have. So um, it's really important to be able to do that. Either send it directly to me at the Conservation District or send it to one of the board members and they'll get it to me. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. We certainly appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.